Last month, we went over nutrition changes with age. So if you have not seen this, it is up on the respective Facebook pages. And we really talked about fewer calor calories, but more nutrients, benefiting more protein, more fiber, how you may need more vitamins, how as we age, we're more prone to dehydration and some struggles with getting enough food. We went into a lot more depth in all of these categories and really kind of discussed options, things you need to do to work on making better choices or improvements in these areas. So tonight, we're gonna to go over balance and balance is incredibly important. Balance is something that we rarely think about, unfortunately, until it's gone or until we need it. So in sports, balance plays a huge role. Day to day though, we really try not to be off balance. And any good training program does incorporate balance into it. And a lot of studies have shown that improving your balance can really prevent injuries for athletes at any level. So when we look at balance, balance is made up primarily of three areas. It's your inner ear. It's being able to decide for your body whether you're standing straight up, whether you're at an angle this way, that way, and that is all done by your inner ear. Your vision plays a role in your balance, meaning physically seeing are you straight up, are you at an angle? And then you have your proprioception, which is your muscular system. Now, one of the big things we have people who are blind who have great balance. Their muscular system has taken over and provided feedback to them where their vision does not provide any information. People who are deaf or have had inner ear problems, their muscles take over and provide feedback. I know for myself, I was on the Cal State Northridge water ski team and I developed an inner ear infection to the point of I had to be on anti-vertigo medicine for a month and I couldn't even drive even on the medication. And to this day, I can't go on roller coasters. I can't do anything like that because my inner ear is messed up. But I have great balance and can still do sports. It's just other things have taken over where that has fallen off. So you can improve balance and balance really relies on strength. So balance is one of the four types of exercise. The first program we talked about strength. We talked about strength training, how important was it? And we put out an exercise program. And tonight I'm gonna to talk about how do we take some of those exercises from that program and adjust them or focus them to work on your balance a bit more. So anything that you do, any type of exercise that you do can help improve your balance. If you go out hiking, that can help improve your balance because you're going one foot to the other, transitioning heights and unstable areas. That will improve your balance. Lower body really improves your balance. So day-to-day -day walking up and down stairs, all of these things can definitely help. Now, if there's a problem with balance, it's primarily because of these factors. Muscle weakness is one of the top issues. Joint stiffness, inner ear problems, certain medications can significantly affect your balance, and then lack of activity. So I'm going to focus on the highlighted areas. I'm not going to really go through inner ear or medications, but we're going to talk about muscle issues, lack of activity, and joint stiffness. So what muscles are we primarily talking about? Believe it or not, your core. Your core is a very important part of this for balance. So when we talk core, we're talking not just your abs in front, we're talking all the way around, your obliques, which are love handles on the sides, and your lower back. 
your core connects your upper body to your lower body. So if your core is weak, you might move your upper body and that disconnect between your lower body won't allow you to stay balanced correctly. You'll lose your balance a lot easier. Your legs, this is the biggest issue and glutes are a close second. Exercises on a single leg, anything where you bend, twist, lift, your leg muscles are a huge part of this. So getting that overall strength in your legs is a major part of your balance and being able to stay balanced. Your glutes are a close second. So this is your butt, basically. This is, number one, your single largest muscle. Number two, your glutes actually stabilize your hips, especially if you're on one leg. So if your glutes are not strong and you pick up one foot, it becomes very difficult to stabilize that hip and stay balanced. So one of the things that we talk about, as people age, they actually kind of lose their butt. They end up with kind of a flat butt. <laughs> that actually is a loss of muscle mass in your glutes. So having a really flat butt as we get older actually is not one of the things we recommend because it tells me you may not have as much strength in your hips to stabilize yourself. And then your back, your lower back and even your upper back are also components of muscle fitness and strength that affect your balance. If your upper back is weak and you tend to have a forward tilt, it's gonna put your center of gravity off. It's going to make it far easier to fall forward because your weight's already moving in that direction. So those are the primary muscle groups that we talk about when we talk about improving your balance and making sure you can stay balanced. And we're gonna talk about some ways to test your balance and what exercises you need to do to work all of these areas. Now, when we go over balance, it is a motor skill. It can be improved. And the old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it, plays a big role in balance. So like I said, we rarely try to be off balance. What that means is, you're not using your balance very much day to day, week to week. So when you need it, it's not there. And that's not the time to find out your balance is not good. The flip side of that is to improve your balance, we actually have to put you slightly off balance, meaning we need to force your body to react, to adjust, to stabilize, to keep you balanced. So the question is, how do we do it safely? I don't want you standing on something unstable in the middle of the room with nothing around. That is not the best way to do it. I don't want you stepping on ice. That's not the way to chat well. It will challenge your balance, but that's not a good training way. You need to do a safe, controlled way of working balance. Meaning, when I work with someone on balance, any exercises, I make sure there is something solid, stable, that they can hold on to. A chair on rollers is not solid and stable. If it can move out from underneath you, if it cannot support your body weight, it is not stable enough for you to use during balance exercises. So I actually, if I'm in a gym, I will put people in the big squat racks because I know they can grab onto anything in there and it's going to be solid and stable. We might not be doing squats in there. We might be doing leg raises, but it's a safe environment where they can grab a hold of anything and it's not going to move. So you slowly progress up on exercises to reduce the stability, and I'll talk about how that works. The other thing, at the higher end of balance exercises, you can simply close your eyes. 
30% of balance is visual acuity. Where are you in space? Are you staring straight ahead? Are you tilted to one side? Your eyes tell you that first. A lot of people cannot close their eyes and stand still. They start wavering or tilting. Ideally, when you close your eyes, your muscles should take up that proprioception, meaning give you feedback of where you are. Do I recommend closing your eyes initially on any exercise? No. This is more advanced. This is after you've mastered all the other exercises with your eyes open. And still we do this in a controlled environment, meaning I will literally put somebody in a corner with their back to the corner so that there's no place they can fall. If they start to lose their balance, they're gonna move an inch backwards and run into the wall in a corner. So they're not gonna go directly backwards. They're not gonna move very far left or right. And I will be in front of them so they can't fall forward. That's the only time I have people close their eyes. So safety first. Now, when we look at balance, we start getting into the physiology of muscle fibers. So coming up on Thanksgiving, how many people, if you look at a chicken, red meat and white meat, everybody has a certain flavor that they like. And this is the easiest way I can explain fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. Every muscle in your body is partially fast twitch or partially slow twitch muscle fibers. And it's exactly like they sound. Some react faster than others. Fast twitch literally means it moves quicker. It does not have good endurance meaning you're not gonna use it long-term, you use it short-term and quickly. So those are the muscles we use for balance. And once again, if you don't use them, you lose them. So we'll talk about how to train them. Some people have more fast twitch than others. Some people are genetically sprinters. Some people are genetically more slow twitch, they're great marathon runners. That is fast twitch versus slow twitch. If you look at a chicken, white meat versus dark meat, that is fast twitch muscle fiber versus slow twitch muscle fiber. That's the, what gives the meat the coloring is which type of muscle fiber is it. So, I know it's going to be terrible. You're going to think about that when you eat Thanksgiving turkey. But that's a quick way to differentiate fast twitch from slow twitch is actually the coloring of the muscle. Everybody has this, and you can improve your fast twitch muscle fiber. Now, here's something else to think about. If your goal is to get better, stronger, faster, lose weight, whatever, if you're not working that fast twitch muscle fiber, that can be 50% of your musculature. Which means if you're not working that muscle, you're not getting stronger, you're not getting faster, and you're not increasing your metabolism. So that fast twitch muscle is very important. We use it a lot more for sports, but for balance, that's what's going to keep you balanced, keep you stable. In an emergency, that's how you're going to react is that fast twitch muscle fiber. So even for driving, the oh no moment, somebody slams on their brakes in front of you, how quickly you can step on the brakes, how quickly you can avoid that crash, that's fast twitch muscle fiber. So training it can actually help you in other forms of life, not just falling. But balance tests, we're going to talk about four easy balance tests. So standing with your feet side by side, do not lock your knees. So remember from the military, you never lock your knees. You're going to stand 
feet side by side, keep your eyes open. You should be able to hold this position for 15 seconds without needing any type of assistance or support. You may waver a little bit, but you should be able to hold this position solidly and firmly. If you're not sure on any of these, make sure you've got something to grab a hold of and stabilize yourself before doing any of these tests. So that's the first one. You should be able to hold it for 15 seconds. The next one, you're going to place the feet together, but the instep basically of the feet next to the toes. You should be able to do this, and this is gonna be two different tests because you're gonna change which one is forward. You should be able to hold this for 10 seconds on each side. So now we've narrowed your base of support. We've actually made it more difficult by bringing your feet closer together narrower base of support, you need more balance to do this. You should be able to hold this for 10 seconds, eyes open again, without any type of support. The third one, now we're getting into one foot in front of the other. Lined up nice and straight, same thing, heel touching toe, you have to test each side independently holding it for 10 seconds. Keep your knees bent, don't lock your knees. Always keep your eyes open on these. So you should be able to hold it and be stable, not listing to one side or the other, solid and stable. If you can pass this one, the final test is one foot. You should be able to hold one foot does it matter how far you put the foot off the ground? Not initially. Keeping the other foot just hovered off the ground is fine. The higher you lay, raise that leg that's not on the ground, the more challenging this is gonna become. You should be able to hold this for 10 seconds, each leg. So these are the four major balance tests that we perform. Now, if you look back on that very first program that we did on strength training, I gave you a number of tests that you could perform to actually look at your balance, your agility, things like that. They're different tests than this. So those will also test how can you put all of this together with strength, with fast twitch muscle fiber to get you moving. So any exercise can be adjusted to help you improve your fast twitch. I'm gonna use examples of the exercise program that we gave and that's put up on the Facebook sites so that you understand how to change them up. Now the first one is a bridge. This one's specifically going to work your hips and glutes. This is to be able to stabilize your hips. So with any exercise, if you move up quickly, down slow, it's going to work more fast twitch, not as much slow twitch. The other part is the more weight or the more load you have, the more you're going to work fast twitch. So heavy lifters work fast and slow. The way the body works is, if this is easy for you, your body's only recruiting the slow twitch muscle fibers. If we added weight to it, even if you were not going fast, your body would start using those fast twitch to help the slow twitch perform the exercise. Or you can try to actually perform the exercise faster to engage those fast twitch muscle fibers without adding weight. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So you can do that to any exercise. This is a great one because this specifically targets your hips and glutes. One way to 
progress this exercise up is actually single leg, having one foot slightly off the ground and you're doing it, you're lifting the hips up with only one leg, then the other leg. That's gonna force each hip and glute to work independently now and strengthen them. It also means because you're going from two legs to one, it's a lot more weight or load. So it's gonna challenge your body a whole lot more by doing single leg versus both legs at the same time. So that is a great exercise. Could you do this on your bed? Yes. You do not have to get all the way down to the ground to do this exercise. You can do it off your bed. You could do it off of a couch or sofa. Any place where it's easier to get up and down from, you don't have to get down to the ground for this one. It's the movement, not getting down to the ground, that's actually in causing most of the increases or adjustments. Next thing, a plank. Once again, this is going to work your hips and glutes, your back. It's going to work your legs. Do you have to get down to the ground for this one? No, you do not. One way that I have people do planks at home, if you have your forearms and elbows on something higher, think your kitchen counter with your feet still on the ground, you're still performing a plank. Hmm. The only difference is by raising your upper body, I'm not leveraging as much of your body weight against those muscles. I've made it easier. As you get stronger, find something that's a little bit lower. You could start with the kitchen counter, go down to the edge of the couch, go down to the cushions on the couch before you ever get to the ground. That's fine. It's still challenging the muscles. It's still working on getting you stronger. Nothing states you have to do it on the ground. So that is an option, but it's not your only option. Supermans. So once again, you can do this off the bed. Nothing states you have to get down to the ground. Do you have to go up as high as she's going with this? No. Start with a shorter range of motion. Start with just barely lifting the hands and feet off the ground. If you can come up higher, great. Don't force it. If you do this a little more quickly, it's going to work those fast twitch muscle fibers. Now we're working upper back, mid back, lower back, hips and glutes, and hamstrings all in one exercise. So this is working what we call the posterior chain, all muscles that are involved in your balance, and you can start with these off the bed or off something easy. Nothing states you have to get down to the ground for them. Moving on, standing hip flexion. This is literally standing and picking one foot up. Can you do this with your hand on the chair or hand on the kitchen counter for stability? Yes. Does that take away the balance? A little bit. So how would I progress this? If you have one hand on the kitchen counter and you can pick the leg up, two ways to progress this exercise. Can you lift that leg up higher, meaning up where your thigh is parallel to the ground? That's going to make this exercise more challenging. It's going to involve more balance. Do I have people go either hand on the counter or nothing at all? No. I actually slowly work it down. Have your whole hand on the counter. If you can do that and that's getting easy, just have four fingers on the counter or on the chair. When that becomes easy, just three fingers holding and balancing you on that chair. Then down to two fingers, then down to just one finger. It's slowly putting you a little more off balance and forcing your muscles and your body to make up that difference. It's not an all or nothing. It's a way to slowly challenge your body and force it to adapt to gain more balance. That's all we want to do. 
we don't want to put you at a point where you risk losing balance. We just want to challenge the body a little bit more to force it to adapt. Now, one of the other ones is a squat off a chair. If this is challenging, it's gonna work those fast twitch muscle fibers. Notice she's, this picture basically shows her in the middle of the floor. Don't do that. I want the back of the chair up against the wall or up against something else. If you come down too quickly and hit the edge of the chair, it'll shoot out from underneath you. I want that chair located someplace solid and stable where that chair will not move. So if you have a sofa, if you have something that's heavier, more solid and stable, that's not going to move, great. One of the other reasons why I put a chair behind people, this is actually a great way to learn to squat correctly. If you look, that very end piece where she's kind of halfway up over the chair and hanging, by putting a chair behind you, it actually forces you to stick your butt out. That is correct squat form. I don't want your knees to go forward past the end of your toes. If your knees go too far forward, that actually puts a sheer force behind your knees. That's why people's knees ache when they squat. They're actually not sticking their butt out far enough behind them. If you start the motion with your knees going forward, that's incorrect. You start the motion by sticking your butt out like you're going to put it on a chair behind you. So chair squats are great because it actually reinforces proper form. I don't want you going lower than that. You notice when she's seated, her knees are a little bit lower than 90 degrees. You could even go with something higher than this. If it's higher, it's going to be easier. Is it still working the same muscles? Yes. But the lower you go, the more body weight or load there is against you. The reason why it's very difficult sometimes to get out of somebody else's couch that's really low, if your hips are below your knees, it takes a lot more strength to overcome that angle to come back up. So the lower you go, the harder the exercise is, the more of your own body weight we're using against you. Start with a chair, something that's going to put your thighs parallel to the ground, no lower than that. So start with a chair, maybe not the kitchen couch, or sorry, the kitchen couch, the, the couch, because the couch may be a little too low. If you want to work on fast twitch muscle fiber with this, you stand up quick, you go back down slow. Standing up quick is going to work those fast twitch muscle fibers that will directly affect your ability to hold your balance and react to a fall. So standing up quick, down slow, is going to work those fast twitch muscle fibers, and it's going to work all the muscles in the lower back, hips and glutes, hamstrings, quads, calves, and feet that you're going to need for balance. So this is a great exercise. This is probably, this and bridges would probably be the top two exercises to really work on your balance. And then seated leg extensions, extending that leg out in front of you so it's straight, bending it back. That's going to focus more on your quads. It's a great exercise. You can sit back further on the chair. You do not have to sit that far forward on the chair like you're almost going to fall off. You can sit a lot further back and be just fine. Once again, extend it out quickly, but be very careful. I don't want you to lock out that knee quickly or pop that knee. It's out quick, almost to full extension. Bring it back underneath you. This is good, but not as good as squats. Squats are going to be far better than this. This is going to focus mostly on your quads. That's one of the primary muscles for you standing and standing up and sitting back down again. 
And lastly, calf raises with a chair. So I want you holding on to something. You're trying to just come up on the balls of your feet as high as you can, back down, touch the heels to the ground. Once again, if you do this going up quickly, back down slow. Up quickly, back down slow. This is going to really work your calves. This is also going to really relate to being able to balance yourself and recover from a close fall. Your calves are a very important part of it. That ankle mobility and flexion is a very important part of it. So these are all exercises that I gave you on that beginning program. How you do them can affect whether you're working slow twitch or slow twitch and fast twitch muscles. I want you working both. If you work slow twitch and fast twitch, you're actually going to be working more muscles in the same amount of time. It will improve your strength and your balance. So we can do it by moving a little quicker. We can do it by putting heavy weights on you. Let's start with maybe moving a little quicker. It's going to be a lot safer than putting heavy weights on you. Now, one thing I used to do, and it's not pictured on here, one thing I used to do with a lot of my clients when I work one-on-one -on -one with people is I would actually have them box. I would actually put boxing gloves on them. No, I would not try to hit them. Um, but I would give target mitts, and they had to hit the target mitts. That was great upper body fast twitch muscle. It worked chest, it worked back, it worked shoulders, biceps, tricep. That helped them more quickly reach out to something if they were a little off balance and stabilize themselves. That's fast twitch muscle fiber. So you can do what's called shadow boxing, which is basically punching the air. You never lock out that elbow. You don't fully straighten out that elbow, but you're literally trying to punch the air quickly. That's working the arms, the chest, the back, the shoulders, but that's working fast twitch muscle fiber. So big things here. I do want you exercising. I want you working a lot of lower body and all the things that are in that exercise program. Lifting one leg up, that's a big part of balance. Any exercise that you do where you're working one leg then the other, that's balance because it's going to really get into your hips. It's going to get into switching your body weight side to side. So when we talked in the first lecture, functional fitness. If you're working out on machines only, you're not improving your balance. Functional fitness means the exercises you do directly help your life outside of the gym. So functional fitness includes working on your balance, getting you stronger, but in ways that you're going to functionally use it. And balance is a huge part of that. So how you work out can affect your balance. If you're working on doing things a little more quickly, then slow, it's going to work those fast twitch muscles, which you need and are going to use to keep yourself balanced or to recover from almost falling. By making sure you have those muscles, your body can use and activate them. It means when you need them, they'll be there for you. Because if you're not using them or doing anything with them now, that moment where you're off balance and you're trying to catch yourself, they won't be there for you because you have not used them. So it's literally use it or lose it. Now, before we get into questions, Dave wanted me to talk about if somebody in the house has fallen, what do you do? How can you help get them up? So it depends on a number of factors. Number one, it's really going to depend on in, an injury. If they have broken something, 
do not try to help pull them up. Call 911, please get additional help. If they have hurt mostly their pride, but a little bit of muscle and everything else, but not broken anything, you're going to try to get them up in stages, meaning don't try to just have them grab a hold of you and pull themselves up or you pull them up. That will not work. One of the big things we say in emergency medicine is make sure you're not the next victim. So if you try to pick them up or they try to pull themselves up based on your balance, you're the next one down. So usually you're going to try to get them to roll over. So we want them basically on hands and knees because that way they're going to have better leverage to work on getting themselves up. You're going to want to bring a chair or something over to them to give them better leverage. So an ottoman, a footstool, something where we can get them a foot up off the ground instead of all the way up at once. They can lean on it. They can put their body weight on it, not on you. You can be there to assist, but you're not going to carry or load their body weight. It will not happen. So you need to provide other mechanical forms, typically furniture, something solid and stable, they can push off of to help leverage themselves up, not you. Once you get them up onto, let's say, an ottoman, either sitting or kneeling, then we can talk about bringing a higher chair over to help them get to more of a standing position. If you don't have that, it's literally, they need to get rolled over so they're literally on hands and knees. And unfortunately, it's literally helping on hands and knees walk them over to something that they can help themselves get up. But if you're relying on just you to be their leverage point, no. Get your phone, make sure it's close because you're going to be the next person down and injured. So if they're hurt, call 911. If they're not hurt, we don't want them on their back. We want them rolled over, ideally up on hands and knees. From there, we want a piece of furniture close to them, not a chair that's got rollers. We want a solid piece of furniture that they can put most of their body weight on to help leverage and push off of to get up. You can assist a little bit, but you are not carrying their body weight at that point. Then if need be, get a bigger piece of furniture, a bigger chair or something more solid and stable to get them up from that lower position. Questions. Um. Really, did I answer everything? <laughs> Dale, do you do these exercises every day, these balance exercises? Great question. So, no. <laughs> no. You don't balance exercises every day. Two to three times a week would be great, but you don't necessarily have to do them every day. If you're really unbalanced, it would not hurt you to do them every day, but especially as we're talking the bigger exercises like the squats and those things. Yeah. No, I only want that three times a week, every other day. So I want a day break in between. You do not get better, stronger from actually performing the exercise. You get better and stronger when your body recovers from you performing the exercise. A lot of times if you do it, multiple days one after the other and there's not enough recovery break in there you do not see the benefits from it your body does not recover does not repair you're literally just kind of wearing yourself down and beating yourself up 
instead of exercise, recover, get stronger. Exercise, recover, get stronger. So good question. Thank you. If you're able to do those tests that you described and you go through the exercises, if you're able to do the tests at the beginning, how do you know you're progressing? So these tests are actually more basic than those first tests that I gave you. So that first lecture where I gave you, I think it was six or seven tests. Those tests with the times of how long it should take you to actually complete the test. Right. Those are going to be a better gauge of can you put all this together in a functional format? So, because one of the tests is a, you're sitting in a chair, you have to stand up without your hands, mm -hmm. walk eight feet, turn around and come back and sit back down for time. So that now gets into your fast twitch. How quickly can you get up? Your balance, how quickly can you move forward, turn around, come back and sit down? If you don't have good balance, you're not doing that very well. So if you can do all these well, those tests are going to be a great indicator and you should be able to improve your time on those. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? How many repetitions of each of these exercises are you looking at per, per set? So most are going to be three sets of between 10 and 15. Start out with two or three sets of 10. Then I gradually want you challenging yourself a little bit more by doing more repetitions. So normally the way I progress an exercise program is I'll start off with three sets of 10. Then we'll work up to three sets of 12. Then we'll work up to three sets of 15. So we've gotten a little bit of strength. Now by going sets of 15, we're slowly working on endurance with the strength that you've built up. When you can get to three sets of 15 and that's not challenging anymore, I actually want you to go back to three sets of 10 but I want you to add a little bit of weight to make it more challenging. Then we work back up to three sets of 15. When three sets of 15 with that weight is not difficult or challenging anymore, add weight again, go back to three sets of 10. It's a very, it's an easier progression. It's a safer progression, but it's also a way to progress the strength and endurance so that you're always challenging the muscles to do a little bit more, but we're not trying to beat you up to get you there. This is really the same exercises that are in the four week program that you gave us. It's just doing them in a little bit different way, isn't it? It is. So one of the big things when we talk about always challenging your body, Everybody thinks the only way to challenge your body is add more weight, add more weight, add more weight. That's one way. The easiest way, but it's not always the smartest or the best way. So other ways to challenge your body so that you improve. Changing how quickly you're performing the exercise. Adding weight's an easier one. Doing more sets or repetitions. Anything that challenges the muscle and forces the muscle to work a little bit harder than what it's used to working is going to force the body to change and adapt. Hmm. Everything else is just how we get there. So when I design programs, all of those things are advanced techniques to make it more challenging. The order of the exercises can make it more challenging. We have what are called supersets, which is do two exercises back to back with no rest. Wow. Technically, you're doing the same exercises, 
but by not giving your body a break in between, it's challenging you in a different way. Then we have what are called giant sets. That's three or four exercises all together with no break in between. All of these are just different ways of challenging the body. So with that one program I gave you, technically I could make that program last at least six months just by making some of these consistent changes to it. And it's all going to challenge you a little differently and force you to get better, stronger, faster, everything else without necessarily throwing more weights at you. Oh, okay. When you keep talking about weights, are you talking about actual dumbbells or? Actual external weight. So dumbbells, um, it could be cords or bands that is added load or weight. Um, it could be barbells, it could be ankle weights. Those are all different modalities as well that we use to add load or resistance to challenge the muscles even more. Thank you. So literally there, there's hundreds of ways of doing it, of changing it up. That's kind of the catch. The challenge is what are the right ways that work the best for you safely? So you go to a gym, most gyms, most machines, it's add more weight. That's basically your only option is add more weight. It's one way of challenging your body. But if you're not strong enough to handle that weight safely, it's not the smartest thing to do. So that's why working up sets and reps, working up to maybe doing it a little bit faster, all of those things are going to help your body adapt without adding more weight to get there. Plus, you can do all those at home. <laughs> 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 I see a cat. <laughs> um, I have a question. Yes. Dale, um, for those of us who may be brave enough to get on the floor to do these exercises, um, could you talk us through a good way to get up off of the floor when we're done? Is that possible? Sure. So actually very similar to yeah, what something. we discussed by getting someone else up off the floor. Okay. You're literally going to have to get on hands and knees. Okay. You need something else to help you push off of. You're going to get one leg underneath you to get the foot flat on the floor. Okay. And that's literally to just develop more leverage. Okay. So if you're on, let's say, hands and knees, you're right next to the couch. Okay. If you can get your hands on something higher, the edge of the couch or even the cushions of the couch, Okay. So you can push down a little bit. It will take a little bit of the load off the legs so you can get one foot flat on the ground. Okay. Now, if we can push down with the arms and push down through that foot that's flat on the ground, we can lift the hips up a little bit to get that other foot flat on the ground. Now we can generate more force and leverage to pick the whole body up and anything else we can hold on to can assist that. But trying to just go from your back to standing up, yeah, that's very challenging. We don't do that in a hospital setting. We don't do that either. We, we want people at knees, one foot on the ground, other foot, even if we're assisting, to help get them up. Okay, good, good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. So Dale, it, yes. would it would probably be good, even if you don't have trouble getting up off the floor when you fall down, to go through those steps as if it was you so that when you're trying to pick somebody else up, you have a better feel for what they're going to go through, I think, maybe? Oh. Yes. So if you, can, if you can do those exercises on the ground, great. It's going to help give you practice getting up and down. If you can't, let's build up the strength maybe off of the bed or off of something higher with the goal of slowly working literally down to the ground and getting back up. 
But yeah, they would be good to practice. If, if it's your first time doing it, maybe make sure there's somebody else there to help you. Perfect. Any other questions? Great.